Or, okay, is that okay with you? Please. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our first uh, post lunch talk of the of the day. Uh, we are very very excited to have uh, Drew Vandenberg uh, give us a talk. Uh, so Drew is one of the world like leading experts. Uh, Drew is a professor of economics at MIT, but also like uh, one of the leading experts on uh, learning in games. Uh, He's one of co authors of the famous books in the in the area. And uh, we're very lucky to have him. And today he'll be talking about using learning to predict adverse case uh, cooperation. Thanks so much, Drew. And uh, you you have the floor. Thank you, Georgia. So thanks to the organizers for arranging the conference and for letting us speak on Zoom, which makes it much easier. And I should say this is joint work with Gustav Karskog, who is here and um, is happy to answer any questions in chat. So people want to, I'm happy to answer questions myself um, with a lot of time, but also if you want to put them in chat and see what Gustav has to say, um, that's, that'd be great. So just a little introduction. As you uh, know, repeated games can have many equilibria, especially when the players are very patient. What economists, um, typically do in these situations is assume that people play the equilibrium with the most cooperation or the most efficient equilibrium. And that's theoretically convenient, but it's a poor fit for what we observe when we do prisoner dilemma experiments in the lab. So it seems um, important uh, for economics to better understand how cooperation rates in the repeated prisoner's dilemma, say, depend on the parameters of the game. So it's important both for policy and also as a guide for the development of more useful theories. So, so the way that Gustav and I approach this is as a problem in predictive game theory, meaning we're not going to be so interested in fitting a particular model in sample. We're going to consider the problem of predicting cooperation rates out of sample using data from experiments on prisoners, Peter Prisoner's dilemma. When I talk about this in related work to economics audiences, I often get pushback about why do you care about predictions? So I mean, I'm happy to discuss that here too. My prior is that this audience is you know, much more predisposed to think prediction problems are natural. Um, so if everyone's happy with me taking that as the goal, then I'll, I'll, I'll run with it, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to discuss that now or later. Okay, so we are going to try and fit. Okay, so that's our goal. How are we going to predict these cooperation rates? Well, we're going to write down some learning models um, that are very simple and stylized, but are still so complicated that we don't have closed form solutions for the cooperation rates. So for a given set of parameters of one of these models, we can run lots of simulations and see what the cooperation rates look like. And then we can tune the parameters to um, get the best predictions. So we have, a, I say, a suite of related models. I will discuss many of them later on. We're going to focus on the simplest one, because it turns out the simplest version of the model does just about as well as anything we could come up with. And it only has six parameters, and we like it. So you'll see this model is super simple. It has some learning, um, but the learning only affects what people do in the initial round of each super game. So to clarify that, we look at these experiments where people go to the lab and they play these repeated prison dilemma with an indefinite stopping time. You play the same partner you know, over and over until the coin comes up tails or whatever. That match ends, then you're anonymously rematched with the new partner. And in our model, the only thing that people adjust from their experience is the probability of cooperating in the very first round when they're matched with the new partner. Okay. And we'll, as I'll show, our results help explain some past findings on the impact of risk dominance considerations in cooperation rates and suggest some modifications to them. Some preliminaries, our data comes from other people's experiments. We start with 12 papers that were covered in a meta-analysis by Dalbo and Frechette in 2018. And we added five more papers that were published since their paper. 
We end up with 161 different experimental sessions and over 2,000 participants. In all the experiments in our sample, participants played a sequence of repeated prisoner dilemma games with perfect monitoring. And it, within any session, the game parameters were held fixed. So there are some other experiments where people play different repeated games in the same session of the lab. We're looking at sessions where a given subject only saw one set of parameters. Okay. There's, in these repeated games, people are randomly and honestly matched. And each round, there's a random stopping time. So what that means is the discount factor delta of the repeated game corresponds to the probability one minus delta that the playing um, ends at the end of this round. The probably one minus delta of the game ends with probably delta it goes on to the next round. And this is the point of terminology because we're always getting confusing, confused about this. Within a given repeated game, we'll talk about rounds of the repeated game. And when people get matched to someone else, we'll say it's a new super game. We're going to, these games had, you know, payoffs of all different scales. We're going to normalize the, the payoffs. So the payoff to joint cooperation is one, and the payoff to joint defection is zero. So if the payoffs people were given were their utilities, this rescaling is without loss of generality. We're just dividing by a constant and subtracting a constant. So any prisoner's dilemma game can be written in this form. There's, each player has a strategy cooperate or defect. If we both cooperate, we both get one. If row player defects and column player cooperates, row gets one plus G. So G is the gain from deviating on a defecting partner. And the row player gets minus L. It's a loss, okay? So looking at this uh, matrix, you'll see one plus G is more than one and zero is more than minus L because that was positive, which I should have said. So D is a dominant strategy, okay? And we're also, fine. Start just reviewing some standard equilibrium analysis. The outcome, both players cooperated every round, is the outcome of a subgame perfect equilibrium if one, which is the payoff you get from cooperating forever, is at least as big as the payoff you get by defecting once and then conforming. If you defect once against a partner who's uh, playing a grim strategy, you gain one plus G today, but then your best response will be zero forever after. Okay? So, the little algebra says that cooperation is the outcome of a subgame perfect equilibrium if and only if the discount factor delta is high enough. In particular, it has to be more than the ratio G divided by one plus G. And we'll define that to be delta SPE for subgame perfect. That's the critical value of a discount factor that makes cooperation a subgame perfect equilibrium outcome. Key thing to note is that the loss L incurred when you play C and your partner plays D does not enter into this equation. Okay, why? Because if we're starting with a hypothetical equilibrium where both people are playing the grim strategy, you never expect your partner to defect before you do. So this, this loss this is, is a non-issue. Okay, so that's the this standard classical game theory calculation. Um, this, it'd be tempting to conclude that anytime the discount factor exceeds this critical level, people always cooperate. That would be the most efficient outcome, but there's literally no experimental support for this idea. We say little, that's being generous. Um, other researchers in the past have found that cooperation in these repeated game experiments can be better predicted by measures that reflect some uncertainty in the player's minds about how their opponents will play. 
So, okay, that's a bit more setup before we get to our model. I apologize, we're almost done with the setup. So, let me remind you if we have a two by two matrix game, a strategy is called risk dominant if it's the best response to your partner randomizing 50 50. That's just the definition. Now, the repeated game has very many strategies, but we can take the repeated game and construct an artificial two by two matrix game where the only two strategies allowed are grim and always defect. Okay, that's just, and we can look at the payoffs in that matrix. And it turns out that grim is risk dominant in this two by two game, if and only if a discount factor is G, at least G plus L over one plus G plus L. Okay, so if you remember what Delta SPE was, that was G over one plus G, we just added a positive number to the numerator and denominator. So we've made this number closer to one. So this new number we'll call Delta superscript RD for risk dominant. And the RD difference, which I'll also call size RD because that's, I have stuck in my head. So I, I apologize if I, if I use those words instead. Um, delta RD is defined as the real actual discount factor delta minus this critical value delta RD. So, so this, this RD difference can a priori be positive or negative. This, no reason to think it's positive in all games, okay? So you, if you haven't seen this before, you may be very puzzled, but why is he talking about this bizarre two by two matrix game to analyze a repeated game? Well, the reason is that other people have proposed this measure and they've shown that it has something to do with what happens in the experiments. It's a useful composite parameter of the underlying game parameters, or think of it as a feature, a constructed feature for a machine learning algorithm. The key thing I want you to notice about this size RD is that it depends on the loss L as well as the gain G. And that makes sense if people aren't sure how their partners will play. If you're sure your partner's playing grim, then your decision about whether to cooperate or not, L just doesn't matter. If you're not sure what they're doing, then it could be risky cooperating because you risk losing L's. So that's sort of a uh, intuition for why this measure might possibly be useful. Okay, so that's all sort of background and setup. Having, uh, are there any questions yet? Okay, so let me talk about what we do. Oh, we true. Sorry, this yes. is Nicole. Uh, I, I was a little, I, I think I missed something okay. basic, which was what is this Grim in the previous slide, you said Grim is uh, randomizing over, uh, is the best, it's a strategy is risk dominant if it's the best response to a 50, 50 randomization. That's the opponent is randomizing over the action space 50-50 or the opponent yes. is randomizing yes, over? exactly. Fix a two, an arbitrary two by two game. Suppose your opponent is, so your opponent only has two choices by definition. Suppose your opponent is, is playing each of their choices equally often. What's the best choice for you? Okay. Um, and so then the second bullet is saying Grimm is risk dominant in a two by two matrix game with, with the strategies Grimm and always defect. I don't understand what that statement means. Good. Thank you for asking. I guess it, so we, we it's, yes, it's, it's a bit terse. So here we have the payoffs um, round by round cooperate and defect. Good. The Grimm strategy says start out cooperating. If your opponent ever defects, defect ever after. So let's construct the two by two matrix for grim and always defect, okay? If defect plays itself, it, all, it gets zero every period, so zero on average, right? If grim plays itself, 
It cooperates every period, so it gets one every round. So the diagonal looks, in terms of average payoff, looks exactly the same as, as the matrix we're looking at. Now, what happens if it always defect player playing row meets a grim player playing you know, column? Well, in the very first round, row player gets one plus G and column gets minus L. In all future rounds, they both defect and both get zero. So the payoff in the lower left-hand corner in terms of average discounted payoff for the defecting player, it'll be one plus G times one minus Delta. And for the column player, it'll be minus L times one minus Delta. So that's how we build the, so we, we specify these two strategies. We see what they, happens when they play each other. And then we look at this as a two by two matrix game. Great, thanks. I can see now it, I, this is, there would have been time to spell out this matrix, but you know, I didn't. So thank you for asking. Um, any, any other questions? Perfect. So at any rate, this, this whole thing is just to motivate this, this measure, the RD difference, which we're gonna use as a feature in our prediction tasks. It's, it's just explaining where it comes from. So we're gonna consider two kinds of prediction tasks. One is the average cooperation rate in a whole session, which in a sense is what we really care about. And the other is predicting the time path of cooperation, how much in the first round, how much in the second round, how much in the third round. One reason that we care about predicting time paths is that's gonna let us extrapolate to what rate cooperation, um, I misspoke. By time paths, I don't mean round. So by the time path, I mean the average cooperation rate in the first repeated game, the second repeated game, the third repeated game. Doing that will let us make predictions about what would happen if the lab experiments had been much longer and people played many more repeated games than they really did. And perhaps intuitively, it turns out that even if what we care about is predicting the overall average cooperation rate, predicting the time path, and then looking at the implied average ends up being a good way to do that. So why this roundabout um, path? Well, because if we're predicting the cooperation level in a session, each of our sessions is a single observation. And if we predict the time path of cooperation, a data point is the average cooperation level round by round throughout the super game. So I said we had a bunch of different learning models. I'm gonna focus on the simplest one we call IRLSG for initial round learning, semi-grim. So the initial round learning means that learning only matters for what happens for when people are rematched. So at the very initial round of each super game, that play will vary with their learning. In all other periods, other than the initial round, play is determined by what's called a semi-grim strategy. So a semi-grim strategy, this is a term from the literature, we didn't make it up. Um, the action played only depends on what happened in the previous round. So it's a particular kind of memory one strategy. And okay, why is interest in the semi-grim strategy? Well, past work has found su support for the idea that most people do use memory one strategies. And our own machine learning analysis supports this idea that people are using memory one strategies. So, so memory one would say what you do today just depends on what happened yesterday. Well, there's four things that could have happened yesterday. Both cooperate, both defect, or one cooperate, one defect. An extra feature of what's called the semi-grim strategy is that play after CD is the same as after DC. 
So what happens if I cooperate and you defect, next round our, our behavior is the same as if you cooperated and I defected. Moreover, we're gonna assume that the same semi-grim strategy is used by all individuals and in all treatments. So we're gonna to have to estimate three parameters to pin down the semi-grim strategy. The cooperation rate after CC, the cooperation rate after DD, and the cooperation rate after CD or DC. So that's three numbers. Now, the learning part and initial play. We allow the initial round cooperation in super game S to depend on this RD difference. And we allow it to depend on each individual's eyes past experiences, EI. That's where the learning comes in. And we have a particular functional form for this. So PI initial, the probability that player I cooperates in the initial round of super game S is given by the function in this display. So it depends on a linear function of the RD difference, alpha plus beta RD, plus this experience or reinforcement level EI. So you can see we have to estimate parameters alpha and beta here to implement our model. And then there's a final sixth parameter is the strength of reinforcement. So EI of S, okay? It's going to be EI of S minus one, what the old um, experience was, plus lambda times what you pay off VI that you got in period S minus one times AI, where AI is minus one if you play defect in the initial round of the last super game and plus one if you played cooperate. So if you played cooperate in the last round and got a positive payoff, then this EI goes up. So your probability of cooperating in the initial round next time goes up. How much it goes up depends on this parameter lambda. So that's the whole learning model. It's super simple. And it's too simple to be a great model of any one person's play. But do people at least understand what it is? Okay, so we have to initialize the system. So we'll say the initial reinforcement is zero. So everyone, all individuals start out exactly the same. And then what we do, we fix the parameters and we simulate the model, okay? And we use these simulations as predictions. So when we make predictions, we don't use endogenous data as input to simulation. We let our simulation know what the game parameters were and how long each repeated game last, lasted. And we then estimate the model based on the time path of cooperation, even when predicting average cooperation. So we find the parameters that best predict the time path of cooperation in the training set and use those to predict both average and time path cooperation in the test sets. And as I said, the advantage of this approach is we use more of the data. So a bit of gloss on how we did this. So we estimate the model parameters numerically on 10 folds. Now we, we can do the estimation, um, do some simulations, see what the mean squared error is, but then we want to go and tune the parameters. So in order to do this without adding too much extra noise, we hold fixed realizations of the random variables as we tune the parameters. And we then standard practice evaluate models by their tenfold cross-validated mean squared error. Now this is approach we're using doesn't have performance guarantees, but it does perform well on simulated data. So we can simulate some data and see how well our estimation procedure recovers what we know is going on. And in particular, it can distinguish data that was generated by our IRL SG model from data generated by a popular model in the literature, which is pure strategy reinforcement learning. An important 
point, you know, we say cross validation, there's lots of different ways of splitting the data. Our trained test splits are on the level of a session. So we predict play in a given session using only data from other sessions. We think it would be cheating to use, to, to fold in data from this session into both a test and a training um, fold. Okay. So, so that's how we estimate the parameters. But then we'd like to have a sense of the stability of the estimates. We want standard errors of the estimate MSE. And so we do 10 different tenfold cross validations. So we have 100 different mean squared errors, and that's how we calculate this standard deviation or standard error of the mean squared error. So I told you about our learning model, and we can see how well it does. We want somebody to compare it to this performance. So we also used various machine learning algorithms and ordinary least squares. And we, so we actually being Gustav, um, tried a number of different approaches, lasso, support vector regression, gradient boosting trees, and other things that didn't work well. Um, and he implemented this in Python. Okay. And the hyperparameters will matter like when we do the heterogeneous models of different types that haven't got, even gotten there yet. Okay. In order to do this machine learning exercise, we have to feed the algorithm some features. So for average cooperation, we use this RD difference, which is a composite parameter. The raw parameter is delta G and L. The total number of rounds played, the total number of super games played, an indicator function for whether size RD was positive, and summary statistics for the difference between the expected and realized super game lengths, right? Because if, if delta is seven eighths, then you expect the super games to last eight rounds on average, but some will last more than eight and some will last less. And you know that variance could matter. So we include that. And some interaction terms, because you know, um, obviously not all possible interaction terms, but, but a number of them. And um, this, little tab that says details is signaling that if people want to ask questions about this either now or in the chat from discussion later, there's some extra information that I'm skipping over for now about just what, what these features were. Um, when we predict time paths, we add the current super game, current round, and an indicator. This is an initial round. Okay, so these are features we thought made sense. Again, this, this is something this is more uh, bullet point for an econ audience than a CS audience. The um, um, point being simply that with finite data, you can sometimes really help the machine learning algorithm by feeding it the right kind of features, using domain knowledge to craft features. So we crafted the features that we thought were good. Of course, we can't rule out that there's some other features we could have put in that would have made things much better. If anyone has any ideas, you know, you, you can let us know. Um, so what happens? Suppose our goal is to predict the average cooperation rate. Well, so the monkey score is that us predict all repeated games are the same, predict the average cooperation rate across all of our data. If you do that, the mean squared error is 0.05. A simple thing that was already in the literature is just to do OLS on this RD difference. And you can see that does much better than predicting constant cooperation. And that's in part the justification. The reason for looking at this RD difference in the first place is people have already found that it seemed to have something to do with what was going on. The support vector regression does even better than OLS with a mean squared error of 0145, but our IRL SG model does even slightly better than SVR, which was the best of the ML algorithms. So why is our model doing better than the machine learning algorithms? 
Well, we think it's because our model better predicts what happens when the real life super game length is longer than expected. So our model predicts there's more cooperation when the realized super games are longer than their expected value. Why do we think that's what's going on? Well, we gave both the machine learning algorithms and our model the data of how long the, each super game actually went. If we take that feature out from both of the methods, they have the same prediction error. So, so that's, that's, that's pretty, um, seems like pretty conclusive evidence that that's what's going on. So let's look a bit at the um, actual and predicted cooperation. So we, we sort of arbitrarily grouped all of our repeated games by their RD difference into five groups. Okay. The, the bottom purple group is where the discount factor delta is below the critical delta SPE, so there's no cooperative equilibrium. Okay, and the solid purple line is the actual cooperation rates, super game by super game, in aggregated over all the experiments with delta less than delta SPE. And the dotted line, the dashed purple line, is our predicted level. So they're both kind of declining. The next line up, the blue line, is where the discount factor delta was above delta SPE. So there is a subgame perfect equilibrium with cooperation, but delta is less than this risk dominant level. And here too, we see that the actual cooperation trends down and our model predicts it trends down. The top two curves have higher values of the highest values of the RD difference and both the actual and predicted cooperation trend up. And this third middle region where the RD difference is positive, but small, both the predicted and the average cooperation are pretty flat. Okay, so that's, that's a summary of, of, of what we see. The learning rate we estimate implies a pretty strong learning effect. In particular, it implies that about 88% of the between treatment variance in the cooperation in the initial round of the very last super game of the session is driven by learning and not by the RD difference. So this is a, I think an interesting figure, it may take longer to parse. So on the horizontal excess is the RD difference. And on the vertical axis is the difference in payoff people got, depending on whether they cooperated or defected in the very first round. And you can see that cooperating in the first round turns out to be linked with low payoffs when the RD difference is negative, and it's linked with high payoffs when the RD difference is positive. So that, that fits with this idea that initial round cooperation is reinforced when the RD difference is the positive and reasonably large. So, so each dot in this graph, I should say, corresponds to one experimental session. So there are many sessions with particular values of this RD difference. For a negative RD difference, defection is reinforced more strongly than cooperation in all but one session. That should be one dot here. I guess there's one dot that's right on the line. Um, for low but positive values of the RD difference, the difference in reinforcement is centered around zero. So both cooperating and defecting are reinforced equally. And we think that's why they're not clear time trends in the sessions where the RD difference was positive but small. And our simulations show a similar pattern. Because that's what happens with the baseline model. But it was sort of an arbitrary model and super simple. Only six parameters, alpha and beta for the effective size RD, lambda for reinforcement, and the three 
semi-grim parameters. So we looked at three variants that added one parameter. First variant adds the recency effect rho, where past experiences decay. The second variant says, instead of reinforcing cooperation when you've got a positive payoff, you have some aspiration level tau, and cooperation is only reinforced if your payoff was more than tau. So we can estimate tau. Another variant we call learning with memory one, that's no longer semi-grim because we dropped the requirement that sigma dc is the same as sigma cd. Okay. So all of these are seven parameters. Um, here's some yet more complex models. The baseline model, the RD difference only mattered for initial play, but we could also let the semi-grim strategy, the sigma CC and sigma DD vary with size RD. So now we have to, we have to add more parameters to do that. Or um, instead of learning only mattering for what happens in the initial round, we could let, say, people play memory one strategies, but what you play after CC, you also learn about how to adjust that. Um, or we could say there's a separate learning rate for initial round actions and non-initial round actions. And we can keep on adding more and more parameters. Okay, so that's, that's just adding parameters. Another thing we explored so our baseline model, all eight can start out the same. We could have a model where there's two types of IRL SG agents. So there's both type of agent use the IRL SG agent, but they have different parameters. Okay? So now we have six parameters for agent A and six parameters for agent B and an extra parameter that says the shares of agents A and B. Yeah. Um, or, and this is inspired by the literature a bit, we could have two types of agent. One of them uses our IRLSG, and the other defects every round with constant probability one minus epsilon. So that's, that adds one parameter epsilon. So why have people who defect almost all the time? Because when you look at the data, the people aren't all the same, and some people do seem to defect almost all the time. Okay, ah, hang with me. One last slide of extra models. So there's a learning model in the literature from Dalbo and Frechette, where all participants make a noisy choice between tit for tat and always defect. So they treat this as a two by two game and they do fictitious play with recency on this two by two game. So their exercise was an in-sample exercise. We want to you know, estimate the model on some sessions and make predictions on other sessions. So we have to let the initial beliefs depend on the RD difference. That has some parameters. We also allow for trembles or implementation errors. So people don't necessarily do exactly what their strategy says. And we consider a reinforcement learning model with three types, tit for tat, always defecting, grim. So all the things on this slide are models of learning pure strategies. And they were the worst models that we looked at. The more flexible models we looked at did a bit worse than our baseline models. So you can see that the top three models are pretty bad. And in fact, the pure strategy belief learning models do worse than OLS. The reinforcement learning does a little better than OLS. Then come a bunch of variants of our baseline model that add more parameters. Okay, so all these things have to have better in-sample fit or no worse in-sample fit, but they actually you know, overfit and have worse cross-validated error. And the only thing we could find that looks even marginally 
better than our baseline IRLSG is to have two types of IRLSG. Okay, uh, I should talk a little quicker. Um, Sorry, I have a question. What, what do you mean by two types? Oh, so good. You, so you... good. Thank you. So that's that's um, on the top of this slide. So there's we assume every agent in the experiment is either a type A agent or a type B agent. Both type of agents follow this IRL SG model that I described before with six parameters. But type A agents have it have one suite of these six parameters, alpha prime, beta prime, and so on. And the type B agents have a second suite, alpha double prime, beta double prime. So it's two, everyone's using a, the same basic learning model, but some people have pr the pr parameter set one, some people parameter set two. And it's always the case that uh, a parameter uh, type A meets a parameter type B, right? Never... No, not at all. It's, it's a homogeneous population. People are okay. people are anonymously and randomly matched. So it's it, it's not that A's are playing B's. It's people are playing people. We're going to um, estimate. So we don't know for sure who's an A or B. We're gonna gonna see what um, what we do is estimate a mixture model. So we say, you know, there's a fraction of people are A's, a fraction of people are B's, and then let's compute you know, the, the error as a function of this fraction in the parameters and look for the um, ratio of the numbers that minimize the error. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, it's, 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 it's um, in, in applied microeconomics, they call these mixture models, right? They're used a lot in labor economics. Um, any rate, so it did a bit better than our model, but not so much. So um, we want to know what happened if the experiments ran longer. If, you know, typically in these experiments, play doesn't look like an equilibrium, but you might hope if only people played the experiment for five hours instead of one, it would look more like equilibrium. So we could use the learning model to make predictions by that. Just say, here's the parameters and simulate what happens when the game's, the session is much longer. But we, we can do that. The question is, should we believe the output? So to test if we should believe it, we did something else first. We tested to see how well we can extrapolate from the first half of lab sessions to the second half. So if we can't extrapolate from the first half to the second half, it's hard to be confident we could in our predictions for what happened if things were 10 times as long. So we're gonna take all the sessions and put each session in a training fold or a test fold, not both. And we're gonna use the first halves of training sessions to predict play in second halves of test sets. So the same session is not both training and test. So I use the first half of an experiment in one lab to predict play in the second half of play in a different lab. And then we see how well we do, okay? And once again, there's the simplest thing to do is constant prediction of, of a second half of the sessions. We can use support vector machines, lasso, OLS. So here, gradient boosting, gradient boosting trees were the best machine learning algorithm. But once again, our very simple model did even better. So the learning model is better at extrapolating to the second half of the sessions than the black box algorithms. And you know the, these mean squared errors of the errors actually matter. And they, they tell us this difference between 0 0.022 and 026 is significant. So why is that? Well, you, you could always think maybe um, we didn't do a good job at the machine learning. And if only you had, um, had had your own crack at it, you could have you know, done much better, maybe. But you know, also, it's sometimes the case that a more structured model that encodes some intuition or domain knowledge can better extrapolate to related problems. And that's what we think is happening here. So that gives us some hope um, that we can extrapolate from the data we have what would happen in much 
longer sessions. And we do that, we see very wide 90% confidence intervals for the cooperation rates for intermediate values of ERD difference. So here's some plots here. Um, it's, they're very small, I apologize. Um, but what we did is we simulated um, many populations, you know, long past any time we have data. And what the three red lines are showing you in the simulations, there's sort of the median prediction, the um, 95th percent cooperation and the 5%. And for these gains in the middle, what our model says is the long run outcome cooperation level is highly stochastic, the exact same parameters. You could run the experiment and sometimes you could end up with a lot of people cooperating and sometimes end up with very few people cooperating. Okay. Whereas when the RD difference is very, um, was negative or very positive, then we end up um, both predicting and seeing lots of cooperation. Where's this coming from? Well, it's partly it's a finite population. If people are mixing when they meet, so there's some randomness. The more people we have, the smaller the intervals. There's also some randomness because the super games aren't always their expected length. Um, fine. So that's that's the summary of what we've done. I I'd, I'd like to wrap this up fairly quickly because I have a few more slides we'd really like your feedback on about some work we hope to do and haven't yet done. So the, the summary of what we've done so far is the key to predicting cooperation in a given match is predicting play in the initial round. And initial round play depends on the game parameters and on experience in past matches. And we can predict fairly well, and you can put air quotes on that if you want, with a simple learning model that holds play fixed except in the initial round of each super game and only has six parameters. Now, people aren't all the same. If you look at person by person, we, we don't, in our model, everyone's the same. We don't believe everyone's the same. It's just we want a, a, a way of making good predictions. Now note that our model, even though everyone starts out the same, in a sense there's endogenous heterogeneity because People will meet different partners who play different ways, have different experiences. And once people have got different experiences, then their future play will diverge. So in a sense, there is endogenous heterogeneity that comes from learning. And lots of past work in this area has assumed people use fixed strategies without learning and you know, found substantial heterogeneity. So one thing we're saying is that neglecting learning might lead people to overemphasize heterogeneity. So we're, we're saying that people don't really seem to change their play much except at the initial rounds. Does that make sense? Why might that be? The conjecture is there's some cognitive cost to learning and adjusting. So we expect learning and adjustment to happen when the payoff grade, gain is greatest. And we think that's in the initial round. So to test this, we assumed everyone else behaves according to our estimated model and calculated the potential gain, the potential payoff gain to an agent from learning and adjustment at all different histories. So the best IRL SG model does much better against these IRL SG agents than the best model without learning. And if we looked at the more complicated model where people are learning to adjust their play at every round, that only leads a very small payoff improvement. So, so, so that sort of fits with this idea. People are really thinking about how to change, to meet someone new. Do they trust them, do they cooperate or not? That's where the learning goes because that's what has the most impact on what happens in the interaction. Okay. So the main way, this size RD matters is through the probability of cooperation in the initial rounds of each match. Initial cooperation trends up or down depending on whether it's positively or negatively reinforced, and that depends on this RD difference. Turns out our model also predicts that the values of G and L have an effect that's not captured by 
the RD difference. So in the model itself, we just put in the RD difference, but then we went off and did simulations. When you run the simulations, it seems that if you increase the difference between G minus L, holding G plus L fixed, that doesn't change the RD difference, but it changes our predictions. So the model says this matters. Now you, you say, well, okay, good. You have a new prediction. Why didn't you test it? Well, because there's not enough different experiments with the same RD difference in different GL for us to test it. Okay, good. Um, we also consider the problem of predicting an individual's next action round by round condition on the history so far. So that resembles a common approach in the literature, which is to choose parameters of a structural model to maximize the in-sample likelihood of all the decisions. So if people use memory two or memory three strategies, then access to the preceding three rounds should help improve predictions, but most of the time people just repeat their previous actions. So most of the play ends up being CC or DD. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm gonna skip over this because of, of time. Um, yeah, should I? So, so we have this one step ahead prediction thing. We did it various ways. I think the details are maybe not so important and neither are the numbers. Um, but here's, here's the thing that is maybe worth noting. We can try and predict play um, round by round, but that gives us very noisy and unstable predictions of average cooperation. And the reason for that is that the individual actions are easy to predict. So a naive model of do we did yesterday has an accuracy of 87%, the best model only 94. Some actions matter a lot more for predicting the time path, the initial round actions. And that's not captured by these models to try and fit the action every period. Okay. And we say ultimately what, what's interest to us at least is, is that aggregate behavior, we want to predict you know, what will happen and not the next action. Okay, five minutes. Um, any questions? I realize I've been speeding up, so I, I, I should apologize for that. I started too slow and sped up. But um, what we want to do next is look at learning in static games, not repeated games. Learning in static games with random matching is well understood theoretically but it'd be nice to know more about what's actually going on. The existing experimental literature employs a method like this one step ahead prediction task repeated games, what will happen the next time people play. A number of papers have pointed out there's a problem with trying to estimate individual level learning models in these settings low power and biased estimates. So again, to compare what's going on, people playing the same static game over and over, being rematched. They're not playing the same partner, they're not playing a repeated game. So if we estimate these, these very, if you get these very noisy estimates of individual learning models and use that to simulate populations, the generated time paths we think are unlikely to closely resemble the actual time paths. So we have work that we're just beginning with Eric Moline that will extend this idea of predicting aggregate time paths to study populations who play a static game with anonymous random matching. And we're gonna again simulate many populations and see what learning model best matches the observed time paths. So one thing we could do is look for models that minimize the mean squared error, which is what we did in the paper I've just been telling you about. But we think this, the time pass here will be more complicated. And we think it might be better to use a different method like approx approximate maximum likelihood. So we're gonna try and do that. Um, there's been a lot of experiments on repeated uh, play of static games but not on such a wide set of games and not all the data from these past experiments is publicly available. So we're gonna get some new data as well. So that's, that's kind of the, 
the, the plan going forward. And um, that's th that's what I wanted to tell you. But you know, we have um, lots of time for questions and discussion. So um, thank you very much. Questions? Well, uh, I have a, I have a, hi Drew. Hi. Hi, Costas, um, how are you doing? Good. <laughs> Thanks very much for your talk. Uh, I was wondering, uh, this is very interesting, and I was wondering um, which of these conclusions you think generalize to other settings with repeated play and so on and so forth? Like uh, what, like if, if, if I were to design my, uh, you know, learning algorithm for a different uh, repeated game, you know, which of these uh, conclusions I should incorporate in my, in my model? Good. So let's talk a bit about what kind of repeated games we're thinking of. So one thing you could think about is repeated games with imperfectly observed actions. So all of the games that we looked at, repeated games, if you try and cooperate, you always cooperate. And there's a fairly large theoretical literature on repeated games with imperfectly observed actions, in particular with imperfect public information. So it's as if you try to cooperate with some probability your cooperation is misinterpreted as defection, okay? So there's been, some experimental work on that. Mm, not enough for us to do the kind of study we do here, because it's remember for us, basically each, each if, um, session is basically one data point, or at most we have one, if any data points as rounds played in the session. So we need our, 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 this, I mean, our approach as needs many, many experiments. And even this setting that we, we do have really isn't that much data by machine learning standards. They would like even more. So, so we can't test what would happen in these other class of games, but there is one key difference to get around to answer your question. So the experiments that have been done on repeated games with imperfect monitoring or noise implementation suggest that there people don't use memory one strategies. So instead, so memory one strategies, um, if you're gonna punish someone, you punish them right away. If someone cheats you once, you retaliate immediately. In games with, these, with imperfect monitoring, then people sort of realize what looks like a cheat could have been a mistake. So people are much more lenient or as what we called it a paper with uh, Anna Draper and Dave Rand, people are slow to anger. So the learning rule we have here assumes people use memory one strategies. And if I wanted to look at a similar exercise in a game with uh, implementation errors, I wouldn't think memory one strategies were a natural starting point. And we used them here because people had already found that in this class of games, memory one seemed to be enough. So that's one concrete class of games I have an answer for you on. Um, what other kind of repeated games are you interested in? Oh, this is very this is very interesting uh, yeah uh, about the complete information games yeah I was thinking more broadly yeah so if because you know a lot of work is modeling learning behavior in games uh, you know typically people think about FTRL type algorithms uh, multiplicative weights and so on and so forth and uh, yeah of course here you you think about the repeated game not uh, and it was the, the Norigat learning framework. But uh, yeah, I was curious what is reasonable to bake in uh, a model of uh, behavior in these kinds of settings. Uh, it's, it's an excellent question. It's, it's, it's very open. You know, it's no, what we did was very much ad hoc and so sort of inspired by this knowledge of you know, the, the data told us that memory one was probably going to be good enough. Um, then the fact that learning, we only needed learning for the initial round and nothing else, we didn't know that going in. You know, so we ran these other versions that were much more flexible you know, more, and they ended up not helping. Again, it all depends what you're trying to do. If you're trying to accurately model play of an individual person, our model is hopelessly naive for that. But I guess our point is that if what you care about is aggregate play, you don't need a great model of 
what people do round by round. What you need is, is a good model of the key thing, which seems to be this initial round cooperation. And maybe not the repeated games that matters too, because it's what happens at the start of a new relationship has a big impact. I mean, I, I could believe that's a robust finding, but um, you know, this is early days. Um, at a higher level, the, the thing that I think carries over that hopefully of hoping some people in this audience might you know like enough to pick it and run with it is to view this um, view these game theory experiments as a domain for making predictions as opposed to for testing models. I think being able to predict, the advantage of a lab is we can get, you know, make lots of data, we can, we can compare um, train versus test on lots of different games and having models that predict reasonably well seems like a first you know, it seems like an important, it's not the only criterion, but it, 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 it would make me feel much better if we were better able to predict what happens in games. That seems like a, like a good goal. And it's a surprisingly hard sell to economists, but I'm hoping that the computer science community will find it a more natural um, ob objective. Um, I, Drew, I really enjoyed the perspective here that at least was novel to me that what you care about is not predicting how people play or how they think about how they play or understanding how individuals interpret games, but rather how the aggregate society behaves. Um, I just finished listening to a podcast about ants, which kind of made the same point. Like you, you can't tell what any individual ant is going to do, but you know what the hive does. Um, and I, I think this is a very powerful sort of perspective. I'm wondering how, like, you know, is this really what we want to be doing? When is, what, is this the salient thing that, that we should understand? Sure. Uh, it's, it's, I, it's not the only thing we want to be doing. I think it'd be great if we could, um, you know, really understand exactly how people learn in games and so on. I, um, you know, one of the motivations for this work with Eric is in the context of uh, people repeatedly playing a, a static game, you know, the people have tried this exercise of writing down very structured learning models and um, seeing how well they do and running horse races to see whose model fits better. And these things, first of all, have very low power. They can't distinguish different models. And you know, most, at least most of the past work has tried doing this with representative agent um, models and not these mixture models with different types of agents. And that leads to biases. So what we're gonna do is step back a bit and not try and figure anyone does, any one person does, but, but the aggregate, it's an easier problem. You know, I think, I, maybe implicit in what you were saying, this is really cool, it's a nice thing to do. There's maybe more insight if you could really understand what makes each person tick and had a really great model of each person, wouldn't that be better? But yeah, that'd be great. I, I would love to have that. I guess I've become, that, that seems hard. Um, this alternative thing seems useful and easier. So um, yeah, so it's not the, so what is it salient? Is it what we should be doing? It's what some people should be doing. Right now, me and Eric and Gustav are doing it. I think more than the three of us should be doing it. I don't think the entire experimental community should start doing this. Um, but you know, if six or eight or ten more people started doing it, that, that would be wonderful. So I had a kind of a similar question. I've been enjoying this discussion. So I, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, I had a kind of similar question. I've been enjoying this discussion, so I'm kind of welcoming you to keep on this. But what got you interested in this? How did you get into uh, this area and this question? Oh wow, that's that's a that's a good question. So, it's, hmm. so I, mean, I have a long-standing interest in, in repeated games, and I had done some past work on experimental play of repeated games, and and seen how you know well or poorly. The equilibrium theory that I've been crafting fits the data. 
so that you know those experiments were done in the late 2000s, early 2010s, and then Gustav uh, was a visiting student at MIT. He was already interested in machine learning and experiments, and we started talking. So that's I mean, that's that's um, Gustav. Do, do you have anything more to add on on sort of the, the history of thought on this? Uh, I think we also had discussions about the importance of prediction stuff because a lot of the models in the learning literature doesn't seem to generalize well between games, et cetera. Yes, that's right. That's right. So this, this is, this is um, about the time. So Annie Liang was here in the audience earlier, but she's had to go off and teach, but she and I had done a paper on predicting play in matrix games trying to use machine learning to improve level K models. So, so this, this idea that prediction was a thing, I mean, this has been something that I've personally been interested in for a long time. I'm mean, not before I actually did it. I, I wrote like a cheap talk essay about 10, 15 years ago called predictive game theory. The NSF asked people to write little essays on what they thought the field should be doing. And I said, we should be making better predictions. At the time I hadn't actually made any. Um, so it was sort of wishful thinking, but um, Luckily, I've you know um, learned a bit more about machine learning, and I've met some you know, fantastic co-authors who could who could help me uh, do this. So, um, yeah, it's it's I, it's I don't know. It's I how did I start thinking about this? But it it, it just seemed like a natural. It's, it's it's this frustration not being able to use the theories I was developing to make predictions and thinking, wouldn't that be nice? Um, that's, it seems like, a, like not the only thing one wants to do with theories. You can use them for you know, insight and understanding, simplification for counterfactuals, but making predictions just seems like such a natural goal. Um, so that's, that's the high level, why predictions? Now why predicting repeated games while well, working on repeated games, Gustav's interested in experiments. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, and, I don't know. That's about all I've got right now. Gustav, anything else? No, I think that was a good summary. And I think we also try to kind of develop a way to do this within this project that we hope to replicate. Uh, okay, I have a slightly different kind of question, I think. Um, I believe in the results, you ran a mixture model with like two different types of agent. I was yep. wondering whether you ran like, you know, K agents, like K different types of agents um, or whether that would, you know, produce better results out of sample. Obviously it would produce better results in sample. Um, but yeah, I was curious why, why, why stop at only two different types of agents and do you think that more would be better, et cetera? Gustav, why don't you go? Yes, uh, so it becomes computationally intensive quite quickly, the estimation procedure we use. Uh, but I'm quite sure we tried three, at least like two IRLSG and one always defect and stuff like that. And since we didn't see any improvement, we stopped. I think that if at some point saw improvements, we might have continued. But Right, right. I mean, we, we haven't tried it with 10 types. We can't say for sure it wouldn't help. When, it, when you don't see any local improvement, it's not much incentive to keep on keep on going i guess that's 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 the extent of it okay, thank you uh, actually I, I have a question as well uh, mm -hmm. first of all thank you thank you Drew, for the very interesting talk and discussion uh it's already very promising that like a relatively simple model that's kind of like tailored made based on some economic intuition behaves better than a, a wide range of just uh, vanilla machine learning models uh, but have you thought also about testing, you know, your let, relatively low dimensional yeah, econ based model versus other models, like uh, something like experience weighted attraction? Like, does that somehow like that would make would that make sense? And uh, and uh, yeah, so so ex experience weighted attraction on the on strategies or on actions. So the I mean the the way I think you'd have to do that is. Is, is to find attractions for strategies. And then in a sense, that becomes a lot like um, some of the pure strategy models we tried. So I um, mentioned um, 
a reinforcement learning model where people play tit for tat always defect in grim. So that's, you take these arbitrary three strategies and, and, and reinforce those. So EWA is, I mean, it's, a, it's more flexible. It nests reinforcement learning. It, rests ficti it also nests fictitious play. But we weren't finding the more flexible models were doing better and better. So, so we didn't actually try EW. We could do EWA on tit for tat always defecting grim. Um, and haven't done it. I really see no reason to think it would do better. I mean, they're just a side note. The um, most of EWA work that's been done, least work that I know, was on a representative agent model. And one of the, the points of these critiques of this literature that I want to very quickly be um, Wilcox paper, I think in particular says, well, if you have heterogeneous agents, different types, but you estimate a single type agent, single type model, then you will mistakenly, you know, even if people are, are doing fictitious play with different parameters, you will think it looks like EWA because the, um, what you did, so this regret ends up capturing, it's, it's a bit complicated. Let me not ex explain this part of the literature now, but saying the, so the case for EWA is much weaker than the original camera hope papers suggested because they estimated single agent models. And part of the, um, the pulling towards reinforcement learning and away from fictitious play comes from the bias of insisting everyone's the same. So that's does not mean that that doesn't really show that if we did EWA on pure strategies here it wouldn't do better. I just my you know prior is that it's not going to work. But you know the um, we've put together this data set and we'll make it publicly available. We'd be very happy to, to have people engage in a you know contest with us and to try other models and see if they do better. That would be fun. I mean, our model is simple, but you know, I it'd be amazing if we somehow got the one very best model. That that, that I, I I can't believe we're that lucky. Uh -huh. Sounds good. Uh, any any last questions? Okay. Uh, if not, let's uh, thank Drew again. Well, thank you and thank the audience for the question. This, this was lots of fun. Good. Well, I, I'm going to go have dinner now. So, um,